Okay. All right, Kyle, uh, why don't you go ahead? Awesome. Well, hey, thanks for having me. Really excited uh, to have a conversation with all of you, and I hope this is a conversation. So, if you have questions, uh, pop them into the chat, and we'll we'll go back and forth. I'm gonna I'm gonna go through some slides just to give you an introduction to I fix it, what we do, who we are, and and then talk about right to repair, and then hopefully we can we can have a bit of a collaborative discussion. Uh, Shana, can you see my screen now? I can. Awesome. Okay, uh, so I'm from the internet, <laughs> and uh, I like to I like to show this slide. I mean, I, I fix it is a online community. Our goal is to teach everybody how to fix all their stuff, uh, and that starts uh, with simple problems like uh, you know I, I I'm a I'm a big IT crowd fan, so we we always start with this, and then we go into more advanced troubleshooting. If you have a Windows device, um, uh, you know the the classic advice is just to reformat your hard drive. Uh, which is not super helpful if you care about your files. Uh, with a Mac, uh, there's a there's a simpler uh, but more expensive solution, which is to just take it to Apple and hand them your wallet at the same time. Um, and so that's all well and good for Apple and their uh, shareholders, but it's not great for the rest of us. And so that's what iFixit is is working on is. Uh, uh, we're working on uh, legislation around the the, the country that would. Uh, that would guarantee our right to repair, our right to be able to fix things. There are many repairs that you just can't do without help from the manufacturer. So we we uh, started the campaign a few years ago. Last year we made a lot of progress that we had legislation running and I think it was something like eight or nine states. And then this year there's even more progress uh, with all of these states on board. And the most recent state, uh, in addition to all of these, is California. So uh, Assemblywoman Eggman has introduced the right to repair bill. It is 2110, and I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more uh, later about like, what's involved, what the legislation will accomplish. Um, but let me tell you about I fix it first. So our, our goal is to teach everybody how to fix all of their stuff. Uh, people say, well, what do you mean by everything? We, we really mean everything. We have repair instructions for how to fix iPhones. We have information on how to fix bicycles, children's toys, typewriters, oscilloscopes, cars, uh, motorcycles, you name it. We're an uh, open source community, so we're just like Wikipedia. Anybody can add information to the site. And our, our, our thought is that if we can make repair easy and simple, then anyone will be able to do it. Uh, we want to make the obvious choice to fix something rather than throwing it away and buying a new one. Uh, and if we can, we'd actually like it to be easier. If you think about something like a refrigerator, if your refrigerator fails, it's a huge amount of work to get rid of it, get deal with all of your food spoiling, go and buy a new refrigerator, bring it in. Like that's probably half a day's work for anybody and a truck that people don't have, where if you could buy a part off the internet, have it the next day, maybe get some ice in the meantime, that might actually be a lot less work and a lot less expensive than buying a new refrigerator. Uh, we help about 100 million people a year right now. About 40% of those are in the U.S. Uh, and then California is by far our largest audience within the U.S. Uh, this is a bit of a feel of how much content we have. It's uh, around 38,000 repair guides on the site. And those are detailed photo instructions that walk you step by step how to fix anything. Uh, we have been, we started out in the Apple world. And Apple, uh, you know, I've got, I've got my share of, uh, concerns about how Apple does business, but one thing that they do that that really makes our job easy is there are relatively few models of Apple products out there. So there's generally one iPhone on sale at any given moment. This is um, market share breakdown by iPhone model. Now the way that cell phones and most devices these days work is you have to have separate repair instructions and parts for every product that's out there. So there aren't really any parts that work in the iPhone 7 that also work in the iPhone 8. We have to have a completely separate parts stream. Same thing, the Galaxy S7 and Galaxy S8, they're separate. Even, even you go from one Vizio model TV to the next model TV, they're different. Uh, it's the same thing with power tools. You have a drill from one company uh, and a drill from another company. Uh, the parts are not necessarily compatible. So the challenge, and I think a lot of you in the in the waste profession know, the challenge is with the plurality of products, the plurality of models that are out there. Apple makes it easy. There are not very many models. So we Apple's actually the only company in the world that has open source repair manuals online for every single product that they make. Uh, but it's because I did it for them or to them, <laughs> depending on your perspective. And uh, and so we've got the solve. We have a supply chain for iPhones. We have open source repair manuals for every iPhone. And we help millions and millions of people every year fix their own iPhone. We've also provided training to help people start local iPhone repair shops, which is why you've seen in the US alone over 15,000 cell phone repair shops spring up 
fixing these devices. They can do that because they know if they get stuck or if they've never seen a phone before, they're going to be able to find repair information online. So that's fantastic. Uh, the ch challenge that we have is with products outside of Apple, there are lots more manufacturers than just Apple in the space. This is the fragmentation in the Android world. Uh, uh, so that every every square colored square that you see is a different Android phone model. If you're to zoom in on the bottom right corner of this chart, you would see uh, the exact same thing uh, writ large again. Uh, it, it's a fractal the farther you zoom in. Our estimates are that there are over 5,000 different Android cell phone models on the market. And there are just too many models for us to be able to reverse engineer every single one create a repair manual, create a parts ecosystem. It just doesn't work. And that's that's why you see recycling facilities, re reuse facilities, just be overwhelmed with broken things. They'd like to be able to fix it. They probably could make money if they could fix it, but they don't have the detailed product by product knowledge that we need. Um, so that's where I fix it's trying to solve it. It's just, it's just a challenge that maybe bigger than any one organization or even the community as large as ours can solve. And that that's a problem because of the environmental impacts of manufacturing things. We tend to be particularly focused on electronics because they're so resource intensive in manufacturing. Um, I've studied the e-waste problem uh, in a big way. And, and you know, we used to have repair shops in every community and, and over time they have dwindled. Uh, we have less and less repair shops and at the same time we have more and more uh, waste and we wonder why we, I mean, they're both social problems. Maybe we could, we could solve uh, both of them at the same time. Um, recycling also is not going to dig us out of the hole that we're in. Uh, out of all of the elements on the periodic table, the ones that, that you see colored in here are in your cell phone. Uh, and only the ones that are green are really recoverable readily in recycling. Uh, the rest are generally lost in the slag. It's, it's, it's technically possible to recover them in recycling or just the current processes that we're doing and the values of these materials is just not working. Um, meanwhile, uh, electronics are migrating around the world. You've heard about the e-waste problem and challenges around in developing countries with, with some electronics. These are photos that I took at an electronic scrapyard in Accra, Ghana. Uh, and they are actually mining these electronics for raw materials. Um, they're not necessarily doing it in the most effective way. They would be more effective if they had information about how these products were assembled. Um, the, a lot of these are CRT casings. The manufacturers who designed, made, sold, made a lot of money selling CRT TVs never uh, provided any kind of information about how to recycle those products safely and economically with the rest of the world. And so we have so we facilities have. like this doing the best that they can. Um, so, so this is where I fix it comes in is, is my mission is to get information online as much as we possibly can, make it freely available so it doesn't matter if you're running a resource recovery operation in California or if you're working in a scrapyard in Ghana, you can pull up your smartphone and search for information and pull up a schematic for a TV or pull up a disassembly procedure for, for a smartphone. Uh, and this is what iFixit looks like. It's just easy. You can browse through. You pick the product. You punch in your model number. Uh, this is one of the products that we have. This is a Starbucks barista espresso machine. I find it incredibly dehumanizing that Starbucks has called their coffee making robot after the humans that also make coffee. Uh, but here we are. And this is the, the human replacement that you can have at home. Uh, and the Starbucks barista is pretty cool. You know, it, it, it slices, it dices, it makes espresso. This particular one was broken, uh, so I took it apart. I had no idea how to fix it. I just took it apart, and I posted instructions of just how to open it online. And I had never actually fixed it. Uh, but then what happened was people started going on, and hit, they hit edit. There's an edit button on every step, and they started making my uh, instructions better. And before you knew it, we had a full-blown repair manual for this uh, espresso machine, and now we've had over 100,000 people fix their Starbucks barista espresso machines using our instructions that just started out with me just saying, hey, this is where the screws are. And then people started opening up there. Oh, my line is clogged. I can clean that. Oh, the heating element is out. Uh, and and so that's been really, really cool. And we're starting to see other companies get on board. Patagonia has been running an advertising campaign around the stories that we wear, getting people emotionally attached to their products. I think that we'd probably be better off in the world with fewer products where we had more emotional engagement in each one. Uh, unfortunately, you've got some manufacturers that are pushing back in the opposite direction. A friend of mine uh, named Tim Hicks runs a website in Australia, creatively called Tim's Laptop Repair Manuals. He posts information online about how to uh, fix laptops. And um, unfortunately, 
uh, Toshiba didn't like that very much and sent him this this legal uh, takedown letter. Uh, and so I decided to fight back and we launched Operation Fix Toshiba. We said, okay, for every service manual that Tim uh, had to take offline, maybe we can crowdfund, we can raise money. I'll go out and buy Toshiba laptops. We'll write a new repair manual and put it online. Uh, we've been doing it ever since and we've uh, completely been able to replace all of the information that Toshiba made Tim remove. Now, what was the legal grounds? How was Toshiba able to do this? Well, they technically own the copyright to this information. If you think about copyright law, why do we have copyright law? Well, it's designed to incentivize creative contributions to society. It's designed to encourage movies and music and all of the, the, the arts and culture that we love. It wasn't necessarily designed to be a tool for companies to enforce planned obsolescence. Uh, but that's what we're seeing is Toshiba is saying that the repair manual that they wrote is a creative work that deserves uh, uh, society's protection. And I think this is an example of overreach of regulation. Uh, we're seeing uh, a law uh, being used in a way that was never intended, and it's causing significant uh, environmental consequences. I think this is something that we in the environmental community are going to have to take a step back and say, hey, is this a case where maybe this was almost too much regulation, that providing companies with this protection, uh, this copyright protection around, around service information, maybe that's something that shouldn't be copyrightable. We need to roll back some of those laws. Um, I made Toshiba a new logo in the process. I don't, I don't think they were very happy with me, but it felt, uh, <laughs> it felt reasonably accurate. Uh, we've had some cartoonists uh, put together cartoons. So this says, you're under arrest for circumventing a technological measure that controls access to this car. It looks like you'll be needing a new, uh, or t uh, access to this tire. It looks like you'll be needing a new car. And uh, this, this seems preposterous, but it's actually true. You, uh, uh, increasingly, we're seeing the computers and cars locked down to where only uh, only the authorized dealers can do repairs on them. And that's why uh, most recently in 2012, the state of Massachusetts passed an auto right to repair law. And what that law said was that if you're going to sell cars in the state of Massachusetts, you have to provide information and schematics to independent mechanics. So even if a mechanic has never worked on a car before, they can look up the Ford or the GM service information. Uh, it, and it also said that they have to make standardized diagnostic tools available. Uh, after the law passed in Massachusetts, it, it was actually on the ballot. People got a vote. It got 87% of the popular vote. This is a very popular issue. This is not necessarily an environmental issue uh, or a fringe issue. This is something that, that all consumers can get behind. After Massachusetts passed that, the auto manufacturers agreed to apply right to repair nationwide. Uh, and so it's now the law of the land. And uh, as of 2018, all car manufacturers are required to use much more common, easy to use diagnostic software uh, so that independent mechanics can repair some of the complicated electronics on cars. And, and by all uh, uh, regards, the law is working very well. So now we're looking at right to repair for other products. Uh, in 2015, uh, President Obama signed a law making cell phone unlocking legal so that you can make software modifications to phones to move them from one carrier to another. Uh, that was a big step. Uh, and now we're seeing farmers get involved and they're saying, hey, there's lots of repairs that I can do on my F-150 pickup that I can't do on my tractor because John Deere has locked us out. Uh, and we're starting to see electronic recyclers get involved. So Minnesota has a pending right to repair law. This is Amanda LaGrange. She runs Tech Dump, which is a uh, electronics recycler in the, in the Minnesota Twin Cities area. Uh, and she is actively working, she employs, uh, she employs a lot of uh, lower income folks, gives them opportunities, gives them job training, teaches them how to repair electronics. They use iFixit where they can, uh, but she's calling me all the time saying, hey, do you have any repair information for this new product that we got in? And, and we have to say, hey, I'm sorry, uh, we don't. It's just too fringe, we haven't seen that before. Uh, I haven't seen it, but she's seeing it. So if we had right to repair laws that would give uh, her employees much more opportunity to repair products and put them back into use rather than having to to shred them. Um, this is this is one of her technicians repairing an iPhone using some of our instructions. Uh, and so she has been very active and engaged at the local level, uh, writing op eds and 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 raising awareness. And I think it's it's that kind of thing. It's getting a grassroots activism type movement going. That's what's going to enable getting these laws passed. Because the moment that we introduce a right to repair bill in a state, and we're seeing this in California right now, the manufacturers come out of the woodwork and they, 
scream bloody murder and they have all kinds of reasons that uh, that this is going to harm their business. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, anytime you have a monopoly on service, you're pretty happy with that monopoly, you can understand why they want to protect it. Uh, fortunately, the democratic process, legislators don't have to listen to them. Uh, but unless we have an equally loud and, and visible voice on the other side presenting our, our side of the issue and saying, hey, look, we're completely being inundated by products that we have no information on how to repair or how to recycle, uh, nothing's going to happen. So I thought I'd share with you, this is, I wanted to show you inside the product to show you how complicated this is and why you really have to have repair information before you can open something up. Uh, this is Samsung's S7 uh, phone. The S8 has exactly the same uh, design inside. Uh, so to get inside this phone, first thing you have to do is heat it. There's actually adhesive gluing the back panel on. It's quite extensive adhesive. If you try to open it without heating it up, you will break it. And then we have these special suction cup wrenches that we use. Uh, to open it up, and then uh, this is the battery inside. So if you're just recycling this phone, you don't care about repairing it all, you just want to recycle, you have to go through a fair amount of glue to be able to get at the battery uh, before you can put it into a shredder. So we wonder why we're having fires in recycling facilities. It's product designs like this. Even in the process of trying to open this phone up and separate the battery quickly, uh, you're very likely to puncture it. Uh, we tend to take our time when we're repairing it. We're not going to puncture it. But if you if you have a thousand of these phones, you're trying to re remove the battery in a couple minutes per phone. It's very likely that you're going to puncture one of these. And if it has a charge, comes in contact with air, uh, it can it can lead to a fire. Uh, and I mean, when I talk with electronics recyclers, the question is not are you having fires. It's how many fires have you had this week which is a shame. I don't think that's a discussion that we should have to be having with recyclers, but that's where the product designs are taking us. And unfortunately, I have not seen anywhere in the world, I've been in a lot of Samsung recycling facilities, independent recycling facilities. I have never seen one where they said, oh yeah, Samsung gave us a procedure that we follow to recycle this product safely. None of these electronics manufacturers are making information available. And that's one thing that Right to Repair would actually do. It says, make available the service information. Well, that's also going to make recycling information available. So you can see here's the phone completely disassembled. Uh, once you get the glue out, it's, it's a relatively straightforward design. Uh, we rate this phone a three out of 10 on our repair scores. So we rate everything one to 10. 10 is really easy, straightforward to disassemble, manufacturer makes service information available. And uh, a one is it was almost impossible to repair. This is one of the most popular phones in the, in the world. And the fact that it's scoring this poorly on our index is a real challenge. Greenpeace is running a campaign against Samsung right now because of this issue, because uh, the galaxies are designed with so much glue. Uh, for comparison, the iPhone 10 got a six out of 10, so it's, it's quite a bit better. Um, so here's the bottom line. This is the bill, AB2110. Uh, it's currently only in the uh, uh, California Assembly. We don't have a companion Senate bill yet. Uh, we'd like help making that happen. And then we're also looking to um, uh, to collect co-sponsors for the bill. Um, the bill right now is in rules committee, so it's going to be up to leadership to decide whether they want to to move this bill, which means that that it's going to be up to all of us to lean on our elected representatives and make sure uh, that we that we get it to happen. Um, and so just just to kind of final overview, this is approximately what, what the, the, the law says. It says you have to make service manuals available. If there's special tools, you have to make those available for sale. Same thing with diagnostics. You have to make security updates available, and you have to sell service parts to independents. So that's that is the that's the right to repair overview. And at the, at, with that, I'd like to just have a conversation and, and answer any questions that you have. I can toggle back over the video. If you want to get involved, uh, Gay Gordon Byrne is the executive director of Repair.org, which is the advocacy organization that's pulling together all the various interested groups on, on Right to Repair. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and just go back over the video and let's have a bit of a conversation. Thank you, Kyle. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So much interesting stuff to talk about, and you actually answered some of the questions I had <laughs> in your presentation. Maybe that's happened with others. Um, right now, we have only one question um, submitted. That's from Victoria, and I need clarification, Victoria, on your question. Meanwhile, I'll ask um, I'll ask mine since I can. <laughs> um, now, and this is a little bit tongue in cheek, but not completely. So, you sell tools um, 
to the public. You were showing some of those, like the suction cup wrench, which was really cool looking because it looks like a guitar pick. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm just wondering, since people may only use those once, do you take them back? <laughs> uh, we can. Um, I mean, people can return tools. Our hope is that we design general purpose tools that you're going to use more than once. This is a uh, this is a toolkit that we sell. This, we call this the Essential Electronics Toolkit, and it has suction cups and all these little bits that are the special bits that you need for electronics, guitar picks, and pry tools. And the hope is that that once we equip you, you know, you'll you'll fix your phone, maybe you'll swap out your battery uh, now, and then you do it again in a year and a half. Uh, so we find that people generally use the tools for other things. I was actually using this toolkit the other day to repair a doorknob in my house. Oh, so, tools okay. are handy things to have. Very multi-purpose. All right. Um, and now we've got another question. Um, this is from John Davis, who I know you know. Um, he's asking, what happens to iFixit when right to repair passes? Will you become redundant? Right. So does does right to repair make iFixit obsolete? Uh, maybe. Uh, maybe it wouldn't be a bad thing to to have a world where you didn't need iFixit. I would certainly uh, enjoy um, taking some time off. Um, I think you know the, the challenge is that the information that the manufacturers provide isn't necessarily sufficient. At some point, um, I think the responsibility needs to pass from the pr people who design the product to everybody else. So I'll give you an example. I have a older Honda Civic. And I went to uh, my, my headlight burned out, and so I went to replace the headlight bulb. And I was I had the manufacturer service manual that was written back when the car came out 15 years ago. Uh, and what the the manual didn't know is that there's one bolt that holds the headlight assembly in that's designed for easy access to remove the headlight bulb, and it, it always rusts. And once it's rusted, there's no way to get it out, and you have to like disassemble the whole headlight assembly, which involves removing the front bumper. And all of a sudden, my repair went from something I thought I could do in 20 minutes to an entire evening's worth of work. Uh, so that's not really the engineer's fault who wrote the service manual. That's just the product has changed since since when they wrote it. Uh, and at some point, you know, a 15-year-old car, it's not necessarily on Honda to maintain that service manual. It needs to be up to the community of people that are actually fixing it. So that's what I fix it does is we take the information from manufacturers or from the community. We put it in a place where it's a wiki and it becomes a living document that can continue to evolve. So I think that would be the role that we would see I fix it in a post right to repair world is that we would curate and collect all the information that consumers have, have brought us, put it online, reformat in a way that people can continue to build on it. Maybe the manufacturer has an exploded diagram that works for really technical people, but if you've never read an exploded diagram before, you're gonna have a hard time. So we could augment that with real world photos. Thank you. Um, and we have another question, this one from Peter Mui. Um, he is saying that you guys are uh, deploying a cell phone and tablet repair uh, experiment, sort of a pilot through public libraries. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, what, one thing that we're pretty excited about is this idea that local libraries can be access to tools that we're talking about. Well, does everybody need one of these toolkits? Maybe, maybe you could just go to your library and check one out. Uh, and so we're doing a pilot. We actually gave these toolkits to a bunch of libraries uh, with Peter in, in the Berkeley, Oakland area. And, and we're checking that out to see see how well that works. Uh, will people return it with all of the little bits or is it going to be missing a bit? That's These are questions that we want to find out. Uh, but it would certainly be nice if if you'd have tool lending libraries, maybe as, as books move more digital, maybe libraries could be filled with tools. I think that would be a really exciting vision of the future. OK. Um, and whoops, the questions are sort of jumping around. Okay. So, um, another question to do with, um, AB 2010 and whether it covers just electronics or other categories of, um, products or materials as well. Yeah. And I'll, I'll go back to sharing my screen and I'll show, this is the actual text of the legislation and you can pull it up on the California legislature website. Um, it talks a, a little bit about the challenges with electronic waste. Um, it, it, we're basically the, the product cover or the, the law covers the products with embedded work? software. Uh, so that's basically anything with a chip. Um, it currently is excluding medical devices, but it covers just about everything else. Um, so you take a look at the law and see, but we're, we're, we're kind of focused specifically on electronic devices because that's where we've seen the highest incidence of planned obsolescence. 
Um, we have heard from other folks. We've heard from watchmakers and watch repair shops. They're being shut out by folks like Rolodex, where those are not necessarily electronic products. But at the moment, AB 2110 is, is purely focused on, on electronics. Okay. I think you mean Rolex, right? Not Rolodex. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, Rolex. I don't, I don't know how to fix a Rolodex. <laughs> Seems like you know, that, but I'm wrong. Yeah, I was wondering about things like bikes or toys. I guess a lot of toys now are electronic. Um, anything like that that you've come across, you know, where people are asking for help? Absolutely. I, I mean, there are other products that are not electronic, but there are so many gizmos that, that have electronics these days. And what we have found is that the moment that you add a chip to it, there's all kinds of techniques that manufacturers can use to make products go obsolete more quickly. Uh, maybe it doesn't have security updates. Maybe it's got a wireless connection like we have uh, infant uh, baby monitors that, that are getting hacked and being used to, you know, uh, carry on uh, uh, the distributed denial of service attacks. Uh, LG's website says that you should check for security updates for your refrigerator every other month. Um, so these modern electronics have far more capabilities than any of us realize. And there are diagnostic tools that the LG's technicians have for say, shutting the, wire, the Wi-Fi off on your refrigerator, which maybe is a good idea, especially if you don't, don't want to patch it every other month. Uh, but those diagnostic tools aren't being made available to the rest of us. Wow, I hadn't heard of that. <laughs> I wonder what percentage of consumers actually update their fridge. Right, nobody, nobody. <laughs> Hard enough to just clean it out, right? Right. Uh, okay, we have another question now from Victoria No, who wants to know, um, should right to repair uh, pass? Who would be responsible for enforcing the law? Yeah, that, you know, that's a good question, uh, and that's different state by state. Um, so in, in with the California bill, uh, and just speaking to that, uh, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, up to the attorney general. Um, and you can look, it's at the very end of the bill, um, uh, but it says basically city, county, um, or state may impose a civil liability on the entity that violated it, uh, fines of $1,000 per day for the first violation. Um, and that, but then the attorney general is also empowered. So I think it's a reasonable enforcement um, a clause. You could you could file a civil suit against a company under this under this law. Uh, I think we've seen existing uh, the, the California Lemon Law is a good precedent for this. It requires that companies in California make service parts available for seven years, and there have been uh, lawsuits under that law that have been effective. Um, so I think we're we're building on on that precedent. That's that's actually the longest uh, in in the world. Um, there's no other state that requires manufacturers make service available for seven years, uh, and that that has been very effective. It, it's funny, like the laptop I'm I'm talking to you on. This is a six year old laptop. Uh, there's no way Apple would be making service available for this laptop if it weren't for the California law. And as a matter of fact, if I took this laptop to any other state in the country and asked them to, to said, I want to pay you to repair it, they wouldn't do it, but they do they do the repairs in California because they're legally required to. And that's that's a great thing for consumers and for the environment. If I can host a webinar with all of you on a six-year-old laptop, it's perfectly functional. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have another few questions i'm just scanning through them um so from your point of view right now what would you say the biggest obstacles are to this legislation passing in california for the, the challenges are are it's the manufacturers it's um it's uh you have uh some organizations like comptia that have taken money from apple it's apple is the primary organization Yeah, that's what the Chamber of Commerce does. It represents big business interests. Unfortunately, as a member of like our local Chamber of Commerce that doesn't carry, we find like the, the farther you get away from the local city Chamber of Commerce, the more they're representing the Fortune 100 type companies and not not the rest of them. And I think that's really a shame because if you look at what, what the right to repair law would do for businesses in California, it would be tremendously positive. You'd have recyclers that were more profitable. You'd have repair shops uh, be more successful. Um, we've already seen this, uh, you know, all of these cell phone repair shops spring up, but they're mostly fixing Apple products. They're not necessarily fixing, um, they're not necessarily fixing Samsung products because they can't get service parts. Samsung won't sell parts to independent repair shops. So that's something that we'd like to see happen. Uh, 
but you're going to have concerted opposition from a lot of the electronics manufacturers, primarily led by Apple, but they're getting associations. Um, they're getting associations uh, you know, to represent them. And I think, I think that's a shame. It's, it's really interesting that Apple is the one opposing this because Apple's the only one that has open source service information. Like Apple actually sees the benefit of all of this. I fix it has been tremendously positive for Apple and their customers over the last decade. Uh, so uh, the right to repair, I don't think would really change anything for Apple as a company. What it would do is it would say all of these other inexpensive products that are maybe being dumped on the market that have no service plan, like the $99 Android tablets, those would have to have service information and parts available. I think that would really change things. All right. Thanks. And kind of on the flip side of that, you were talking about the fires earlier, and I've, I've heard about that and heard about the impact on say, um, insurance costs for MRFs and so on. Um, are insurance companies a possible ally? Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that, that's definitely something that we're seeing. We're seeing interest in. I mean, anything that's going to lower the cost of repairs is, is going to see insurers in favor of it. Uh, I would think the same thing with the cell phone carriers. We haven't we haven't heard from them publicly, but it would make sense. I mean, you want to get these devices out there being used as long as possible. Certainly with the auto right to repair laws, the insurance companies were very strongly in favor of it. And the auto right to repair got done because you had uh, folks like AutoZone and O'Reilly aftermarket parts companies and the uh, and the auto insurers getting together and, and putting money up to make it happen. Right to repair so far has been uh, much less well funded on the electronic side than it was in automotive. It's really a grassroots effort. And the, the small local repair shops that have been working on this uh, aren't necessarily well funded. So we have to do with grassroots advocacy what, what they were able to do with professional funding. And, and we've been very successful so far, and I think we can continue to be. I mean, every, every California legislator that I've talked to has gotten dozens of calls from their constituents about this issue. So they're hearing about it. Uh, we, need, we need more formalized support. We need cities to come and start sending letters in, in support. We need to be looking at our, at our waste streams and saying, hey, how much can we reduce this? I don't think it's going to be possible to go to a zero waste future without right to repair legislation. It's, it's not going to solve that. It's not going to get us there, but it's going to be a major stepping stone on the path toward for the zero waste future. Absolutely. And that's really why our group um, PRR exists is that you can't recycle your way to zero waste. Uh, right. So that kind of leads to the next question, which is what can we all do to support your efforts? Um, I know you've got a tool on your website, um, not a physical tool, but a, <laughs> a tool to help you advocate for this bill. Um, and you know, maybe you can give some specific instructions about what would be most helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So you can go to california.repair.org. Uh, this has a brief summary. We have a letter writing tool where you can write to your representative. Uh, and then there's kind of an FAQ at the bottom with more details. Um, so get if you have an organization, you have a mailing list, send this out to your folks. You can geotarget, just send it out in California, tell people the bill number, have them write their legislator, or even more powerful, have them make a phone call. So this is a nifty tool that I put together. You don't have to know who your legislators are. Most people don't, that's okay. Punch in your phone number, punch in your zip code, and we'll actually call your phone and connect you straight to your representative uh, one at a time. So it will, it will call each of them. As soon as you're done talking the first one, they hang up, uh, it dials the next one. Um, so this is a really, really useful tool to get people talking to their representatives without, without any prior experience. They don't have to know who they are or what their phone number is, we'll connect you straight through. That's great. Um, so the main thing that we want to ask for is we want more co-sponsors. We we need people to we need people to sign on to the bill. We need a we need a sponsor in the Senate, um, and we need we need leadership to pay attention and prioritize this. I know it's probably hard to say what the time frame is because you don't have control over how quickly things move through the process. And you said it's in the rules committee right now. Um, but do you have any kind of idea of deadline in, in a sense of, or when we would need to submit letters of support and so on? 
I think it's pretty imminent. I don't I don't know exactly. I'm not uh, in Sacramento all the time, so I don't know the exact time frame. But you can see, I mean, activity. This was just referred to rules yesterday. Uh, so things are actively happening on it. Um, if you're not familiar with how the assembly work, the rules committee is really code for leadership gets to do what they want with it. Uh, so the rules committee is where most bills go to die. It's uh, it's it's only going to come out of the rules committee if leadership decides that they want to actually have a vote on it. Um, so at this point, it's I mean it just came in there yesterday, but it's going to be stuck there unless we can really raise uh, the level of visibility a lot. It was in the natural resources committee until until yesterday, and we were very positive that we were going to get a vote uh, out of the natural resources committee. So this this could be a move by our opposition to kill the bill by moving it into rules where it will it will languish and die. So we have to be very clear, call legislators and tell them uh, that this is an important issue. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm seeing comments. People who've used your tools and who uh, appreciate them. I'm getting positive reviews here. <laughs> um, looking for more questions. Hold on. There are quite a few questions and comments about the library pilot in Berkeley and Oakland. I guess um, it's a popular idea within our group. Um, so that's great and that's all peter uh peter Mui has put that together and i'm looking at the documentation he's put together so that's super cool yeah. uh, and and i mean you can do you know you could have people sign on to letters or you could set up a laptop with the the phone call tool if you do in a, a local event uh-huh and there was another question sort of trying to clarify about tool lending versus traditional book lending libraries um Maybe I don't know if you can comment on this or not, but uh, would it be useful, do you think, to integrate those um, where they're not? And I don't know, any other comments about tool lending libraries? Well, I, I just I think it's a wonderful idea. I mean, librarians have been, I think, key to preserving our culture. Uh, and 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 maintaining open access. And, and I think part of open access to knowledge is being able to take things apart. So for example, one of the tools here is um, this super tiny bit. So this is the iPhone screwdriver. <laughs> and it only exists on the iPhone and nobody had this screw before Apple started chipping the iPhone with proprietary screws. So I think that just having access to this screwdriver is is the kind of, you know, uh, uh, horizon widening, you know, window opening uh, thing that libraries are designed to do. So I'd, we'd really love to get more libraries doing that. I think that's also just part of reinventing libraries for the 21st century. It just makes a lot of sense. And I think it also, you think about what are the organizations that cities run. Cities tend to run uh, uh, waste recovery facilities. Cities also run libraries. They traditionally haven't had anything to do with each other. Uh, but what we're finding in the modern world is that the knowledge of how to fix things is really necessary to prevent them from going into the waste stream. So I think I think bringing together two city-controlled resources uh, could be a really disruptive way um, to uh, address a challenge, empower individuals, teach engineering to young kids. We've done we've done events for children at our local libraries where we'll have them take apart cell phones and their eyes just light up and and they have a blast. They think it's amazing and and they come away from that much less afraid of technology than they ever were before. Yeah, yeah, it does seem like a natural pairing. Um, all right, I'm looking at our questions here. Um, any lessons to be learned from other states who've passed R to R? Yeah, so nobody has passed right to repair for electronic yet. Oh. Uh, Massachusetts passed right to repair for autos. Uh, and I think the lesson there is they tried to do it through the legislature for a couple years in a row. And and they were able to get stopped behind the scenes with things like the rules maneuver. Uh, and eventually they put it on the ballot and they asked the people, they said, hey, do you want, do you want to, uh, to legalize it? So same thing in California, things go to the ballot when they can't get through legislature, we probably wouldn't have had marijuana legalization um, through the legislature for another decade, I would guess. Uh, we don't want to go that route. We really think that uh, it's better policy. You get better laws if you go through the legislature and you have professionals that are drafting laws. Uh, but if, uh, if we can't get something done soon, we may have to turn to that approach. All right. Um, so I think, I mean, what I would really encourage is uh, and, and I think the advantage that we have over over the auto folks um, back in 2012 is that we have a broader community. Uh, but we need to get people activated on this. We need to get 
we need to get the legislators to come to the MRFs and say, look at the look at the products that we're seeing. Look at these perfectly good products that we're shredding because we don't have a security update for this. This is ridiculous. Uh, and, and really show that this is a systemic problem. I think you can look at, at getting the plastic bag ban passed as a good example. That was something that happened city by city, county by county, and eventually the pressure grew to the point where California had to do something at the state level. Uh, we may need an approach like that for right to repair. Yeah, okay. Um, and so there's a question here about um, opposition to right to repair other than you know, the big companies lobbying um, in Sacramento, what else are they doing that you can speak to or that you know of? Yeah, it's just the big companies lobbying Sacramento. That's all that's happening in opposition. It just turns out that that works pretty well. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. what, are, what are the strategies that they're using? What are they saying? Well, uh, they'll say things like right to repair will uh, increase security uh, concerns. So Apple came into Nebraska where they were considering a law for farmers, and they said, if you introduce this law, it will turn Nebraska into a mecca for hackers. So they're saying that the moment the people have access to security diagnostics, all of a sudden it's going to uh, uh, reduce the security on these products. And and what's interesting about this is uh, that, um, well, there's a few things that are interesting. One is they're just flat out completely wrong. Every security expert that, that we've consulted, I have a computer science background, I have extensive experience in cybersecurity. Uh, right to repair will actually increase increase uh, security because it will it will make more information available about these products. It turns out, maybe counterintuitively, that the more information that we have about electronic systems, the more analysis that you have on it, the more peer review, the more secure these systems are over time. That's why a, a lot of the systems that underpin the internet are all open source. Uh, being open source doesn't make them less secure, it actually makes it more secure over time because there's more eyes on the problem. Problem. Uh, we found this uh, with automotive as you've had as we've had more computers move into to cars, the more outside security researchers have been able to go in and, and find problems. It's always the good guys that are following the rules. If they have access, find problems, report it. The bad guys, if they find problems, they don't report it. So right to repair across the board will improve cybersecurity. Uh, and that's that's what I find entertaining is that their best argument for uh, uh, fighting against right to repair is one where they're just object objectively factually wrong. Right. Um, the real argument against right to repair is just that they want to preserve their their monopoly. Uh, Apple told legislators in New York that they would be perfectly fine with right to repair as long as they excluded smartphone glass. So I think that's fascinating. Really shows Apple makes over a billion dollars a year fixing iPhone screens, yeah. and they want to continue to have their monopoly there. Um, the opposition is pretty transparent. There aren't any real good reasons, but we do have to fight through. I, I call it FUD: fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So they'll talk about cybersecurity. They'll talk about safety challenges. They'll say, oh, well, people hurt themselves fixing their cell phone. And, and my response to that is usually, you know, I've, I've seen more people. I've actually never hurt, seen somebody hurt themselves fixing a phone. I have seen people hurt themselves using a phone with a cracked screen. <laughs> so we're, we're at more threat uh, from broken devices or from recyclers that are attempting to recycle products without any information about how they work than from information. Uh, it's interesting that, I mean, they're saying, Making this information available will make us less secure. Making this information available will cause safety problems. And I've, I've never seen information hurt people like that. I think I do remember something on one of your videos when uh, some of your colleagues were trying to repair a Keurig machine, coffee machine. They did hurt themselves. <laughs> Am I right? I did. I, I, yeah. No, I cut myself open yeah, trying to open a Keurig. Keurig is a perfect product. It would be covered by this. There's more electronics in a Keurig than there are in a laptop. Wow. Uh, and um, there, it's a product that really uh, ought to be regulated more because there's a large amount of resources that go into a Keurig. It's not designed even to be cleanable. We're not talking repairable. We're just saying like, hey, hey, after I've had my Keurig for a couple of years, maybe I get some mold in the lines. I want to be able to flush it out. It's not designed to be able to take it apart and just clean the tubing inside it. Uh, which is something that every coffee maker should should let you do. Uh, the outside case snaps on. So uh, that's the kind of thing where we need we should have an exploded diagram schematic saying this is how this thing uh, went together so that we can uh, disassemble it for recycling, disassemble it for cleaning. So do we need right to clean legislation? <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, Victoria from Cal Recycle just wanted to thank you for acknowledging the bag ban because. I gather that was something she worked on. She said the effects can already be measured. 
Um, and then we it's have- huge. It's such a big deal. And you look at how it happened. That was really a grassroots movement. It was something we needed a ban at the state level, but it was it was folks like Victoria, it was all, all of you. I mean, it was it was a concerted, organized effort, but that really happened one community at a time. And eventually, we had this critical critical. Uh, mass snowball effect uh, that, that got it done. Absolutely, you see the impact. I mean, our Surf Rider Association here in town is is very happy with the outcome. All right. So going through the questions again. Um, let's see. We've got quite a few. Uh, let's see. So John Davis looks like he's done his homework. He says, um, "You told Inc. I guess Inc. Magazine that 94 million people were helped by iFixit in 2016, but that your goal had been 100 million. Did you reach that goal in 2017? Good question. Yes, we did. Yeah, we. I think we we were over 100 million. I think it might have been close to 110 million people used iFixit to fix things. Awesome. Uh, so that's really cool if you think about you know figuring out like okay maybe you know maybe that was 100 million smartphones eight ounce phone but you multiply that out it was actually 500 pounds of raw material that goes into every single phone that we have so we are starting to have a measurable impact on uh on the material ecosystem of the world uh, but we're not going to stop until we have have built out systematic access to everything that people own yeah and it's for some reason it didn't occur to me till just now that of course you're talking about people all over the world um doing this. Do you have a sense of any of the far flung places where <laughs> people are It's all over the place. I was looking at our analytics yesterday. We had twenty people from North Korea on I fix it oh my <laughs> last month. Wow. I don't know I don't know who they are. Maybe they're the security guards. I don't, but but uh no, we have people all over the place uh using I fix it. And that's that's the goal is you have open source information. Like I don't know who they are. I just I just want to put the information out there, have it be useful, and let anybody anywhere in the world uh, use iFixit. We just launched uh, the website in Korean last week. We're really excited about that so that hopefully we can, maybe we'll have more of an impact on the Samsung and LG engineers. And um, interesting comment about North Korea leads to a, another question from Peter. He's saying, um, you know, right to repair is really critical or maybe critical to democracy itself. Um, he's suggesting we, as uh, as voters, should have a right to quote interrogate our voting machines. <laughs> Any thoughts about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting question. If you talk, we could talk about we could talk about voting systems and digital voting systems for a long time. Uh, certainly, knowing how these things are put together is essential. Um, and and the more transparency that you have, he brings up security via obscurity. That's effectively the manufacturer's argument against right to repair. Is they're saying it's secure the way it is. Uh, and yeah, that's what the lock manufacturers, like the folks who make you know, door locks, they they used to say, we don't want anyone publishing how to pick our locks. And it turns out that it's actually good for that information to get out there because if people show, like there was a common bike lock that you could open with a big pin. And once everybody knew that you could do that, the lock manufacturer had to design a more secure lock. Well, I guarantee you before it became widely known that you could open this lock with a pen, that the criminal community knew that for a long time and bikes were just disappearing and nobody knew why. And it turned out it was an insecure lock. So putting a little bit of sunlight on these and, and showing uh, uh, more people how these systems work is going to result in more secure systems over time. And, and, and I would hope maybe those are systems that will underpin our democracy. Certainly having more informed consumers, having consumers that understand our waste stream, that understand what's inside their products, I think that's going to lead to a, uh, a more open uh, and, and resilient society. Yeah, always a good thing, especially these days. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions. I know, Kyle, you had some uh, resources you wanted to share, some email addresses and so on. Um, I know you've got Gay Gordon Burns' address here. So just directing um, all of you. Yeah, so some of the folks who have been involved in California, um, the CalPERG has been very involved, the Public Interest Research Group. Uh, Californians Against Waste has really been leading the charge. Um, and then, and then of course, I've been involved. Gay is running the national campaign. She's based out of the East Coast, but she's very engaged. I'm, of course, here in California in San Luis Obispo. Um, so, yeah, very eager to uh, do everything that we can to build a network. There's a lot of advocacy groups in California, uh, and they advocate on a lot of issues. We need to we need to figure out how, to, how do we raise this into the top 20 issues that the legislature is fighting this year. If we can make this a high visibility issue, it'll get done. Otherwise, it'll be lost in the noise, like the plastic bag ban was for a long time. It really took a lot of concerted effort to get it very visible to the top of mind for everybody to actually accomplish change. 
Okay. Well, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, Paul Freund has a question um, about manufacturers maybe um, leasing products instead of selling them. How would that be handled by this legislation? Yeah, that's a good point. That It might lead uh, some manufacturers to do that. I would argue from a waste perspective, maybe that's okay. Uh, if, if you have a product, uh, an example is, is set-top boxes uh, or uh, – or cable modems. Like we don't really see waste problems around. Said, hey, we don't want to be subject to right to repair. We only want to lease our products. That's fine as long as you're taking it back, dealing with centralized recycling, re resource recovery. Uh, that's perfectly okay. Um, I think that could be a uh, you know, a circular economy type outcome from this. Um, most, we're, we're, we didn't see that with autos, right? Massachusetts passed auto right to repair and every single auto manufacturer decided that they were going to continue to sell cars. Okay, great, good for you. But yeah, if they wanna bypass the law by leasing equipment and not selling it directly, that's perfectly fine by me. I think that'll lead to a good environmental outcome. Yeah, that'd be reuse, I guess. Um, so there's also a suggestion here in a way or question having to do with safety concerns, if that's uh, something that could be expanded upon in terms of strategies to get right to repair passed. Um, so let's see, you know, in terms of MRF fires, crack screens, other safety concerns that could be. Um, yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the, the safety concerns in recyclers. Uh, recyclers are not provided information by any manufacturer on how to recycle their equipment safely. Uh, even in Europe where there's ostensibly some legislation on, on the books that would require they share information, they don't. Uh, we actually got f uh, some funding from the European Commission, went out and asked all the electronics manufacturers, please share with us safe procedures on how to recycle your products. HP was the only manufacturer that was willing to share it. Honestly, I think they're terrified. They know that they're producing products that are causing fires and hurting people. They know they have massive legal liability, and they're afraid that if they disclose uh, uh, information on how to disassemble their products, that they're going to be on the hook for, I mean, you had the the fire in is it San Marcos where we had the $20 million fire. I mean, these are significant, significant problems, and it's directly related to the, to the device design. And they're, they've been shielded so far. You have a facility go up in flames, you can't point it back to that specific product that caused the fire. Apple just rolled out, they're really proud of their Apple Pencil uh, that, you know, that, that you can write. Well, it's got a big lithium battery. There's no way to separate that lithium battery from the rest of the device with any amount of manual prying. Um, and so it's a product that, it's 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 not landfillable. It's not legal to landfill it because it has a lithium battery. It, it's not possible to recycle it safely because it has a battery that you can't separate. So this is a product that is not possible to handle in our waste streams. And we have the most profitable company in the world saying, don't worry about it. And then actively fighting legislation that would peel back the covers and show that they've got a problem. All right. Well, we're at two minutes before the half hour. So we're going to need to wrap up. <clears throat> I'm putting Kyle's email address in the comments one more time just so it's at the bottom of your uh, notes um, yeah, and if you want to draft letter if, you, if your organization has the ability to send a letter of support to the legislature that would be fantastic I'm happy to, to send you a kind of rough outline that you can customize with your letterhead great thank you and I'm putting my address there too if anybody has any follow-up questions I again I'm hoping that this webinar will be available after today, um, probably on the CRRA website. So I'll send out information about that in case you want to share it with others. Um, we've got comments saying thank you, that it was a great conversation, great webinar. So thank you for those comments. Um, and if any of you are not members of the Prevention, Reuse, and Repair Technical Council or of CRRA, I would encourage you to do so. We'd love to have you be a part of uh, the organization. And um, gosh, yeah, some more thank yous. So uh, thank you for the thank yous. <laughs> and thank you, Kyle. Uh, yeah, hey, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, I know you're a busy guy. All right, well, let's, uh, let's keep working on this and um, keep each other posted. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Cheers.